The Catholic Church is trying to cover up another crime in addition to pedophilia. Around the world, priests have sexually abused nuns who were subordinate to them. I satisfied Father Marie-Dominique orally. He used gestures and signs to get me to do it. A faithful woman, a nun, who has dedicated herself to God and who is abused within the church is wounded in a way that affects her entire personality and inevitably calls her beliefs into question. If nuns and other churchwomen become pregnant after being raped by priests, they must often leave the church. The priests give the superiors money. They then provide the priests with nuns. That's prostitution. I was always careful they didn't get pregnant. And if a nun got pregnant by a priest? <laughs> then anything could happen. The priest could even demand she get an abortion. The Catholic Church condemns abortion. It's an outrage that a congregation would demand a nun get an abortion. These crimes have been denounced for more than two decades by sisters on all continents, but have long been veiled in silence. The Vatican's courts have protected the priests. The victims will stay victims and die as victims, as long as the Church grants forgiveness and compassion without legal action. The Church is a closed structure that gives power to the men, the priests. That goes beyond what's permitted. After two years of global research, the abused, superior nuns, priests, and even confidants of Pope Francis are revealing one of the best-kept scandals within the Catholic Church. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, we are one with the body and blood of Christ. Rome, Italy, home to the Vatican City State. More than 30,000 servants of God live here. Congregations send clerics and especially nuns from all over the world here to complete their education, known as formation. 80% of them are women, most are young. They study close to the Holy See in the hopes of elevating their spirit and getting that much closer to God. That's what Doris was hoping when she came to the Eternal City in 2006. She was new to a Catholic community that is represented in 13 countries. The young German learned as she waited to take her vows. Doris made her eternal vows a year later, committing herself to obedience, poverty, and chastity. At the age of 22, she married God. The young nun lived and worked not far from the Vatican, together with nuns and priests from her community. But then something happened that Doris was only able to speak about two years later. It started with him watching what I was doing. And I noticed, well, I was working, and he just stood next to me and talked and talked and didn't go away.
Und der ist immer öfter da aufgetaucht, wo ich gerade gearbeitet habe, auch wenn ich. And he kept showing up more and more frequently, where I just happened to be working, whether I was in the kitchen or the laundry, he always found a reason to be there somehow. I was clueless, but I didn't think. I didn't expect what would then happen, until one day, when he stood next to me and put his arm around me, and body contact, no matter what kind, excepting maybe a handshake, even that was absolutely taboo. Sisters lived on the first floor in Doris's community in Rome, priests on the second floor. The young nun lived on the top floor, which was normally reserved for guests. The priest and Doris met in this guest room. He came into my room. He closed the door behind him. And I had the room that, because it was a guest room, it had a sofa. And we sat on the sofa. And he reached over and undid the button on my sleeve. And then he undid this button. I was, it was impossible that he would do it and that he actually wanted to do it. It was unimaginable. But he did it. And I understood that was what was happening. I grabbed his hand and said, You can't do that. But he just kept going. Doris was in a predicament. The priest sees the sexual contact as consensual. But many nuns are unaware that they have become victim to something that has long been a problem in the church. All over the world, at all Catholic institutions, nuns are held to their vows of obedience to God and his representatives on earth, priests. Yet some men of the cloth abuse this omnipotence to cross all boundaries. Michel France lived out this form of submission for more than 25 years. She was a 26-year-old nun in 1971, living in a Carmelite convent in bologna bilancourt a Paris suburb. It wasn't difficult in the beginning. I was very happy to be in a place where all the women living there shared my beliefs and had just one goal. Like me, they were all searching for God. Michelle France lived an ascetic life, like all the 12,000 nuns in her traditional order. But two months after taking her eternal vow, she began to have doubts. The church provides nuns with a spiritual advisor to help them with the tasks they face. A priest was to guide Michelle France. It's the first time she's spoken of his transgressions. One day, my novitiate instructor said to me, I think you need help from outside the order. I said, yes, maybe. She said, how about Father Marie Dominique? Father Marie Dominique was considered a holy man in the order, so I didn't have the slightest doubt. When I went into the office, the father asked, would you permit me to take your hand? Then he began to kiss my fingers, one after the other. And during each meeting, he went a bit further towards physical intimacy. He would put his hand under my robe or guide my hand under his. His explanation or rationalization was that he wanted me to feel Jesus' love for me. He said he knew and that he felt in prayer that I needed that and that Jesus wanted exactly that through him. He frequently had a certain expression for it. He said he was the little tool of Jesus. 
Over a two-year period, Father Marie Dominique came to the convent regularly in Bologna to visit her. The abused woman, her faith shaken, ultimately renounced her vows. Michelle France forsook her nun's life of contemplation. She decided to leave the convent, but the priest wouldn't leave her alone. He advised her to continue her life as a nun in an open community of Benedictine nuns in eastern France. Father Marie Dominique made an underhanded arrangement at the priory by introducing her to his older brother, Father Thomas, who was also a priest. Michel France told Father Thomas about the abuse during their first meeting. When I told him about the relationship, he lectured me. I've forgotten exactly how it went word for word, but the basic tenor was, sexuality is a vast mystery. What you experience with Father Marie-Dominique is a great blessing of love that brings you both closer to God. Father Thomas came back again at the beginning of August 1976. He organized a meeting with me for the evening, when the Priory's Benedictine sisters would no longer be present. When I came into his room, he told me, put your things over there, you can get undressed. Then he did too. I was in a sort of state of shock. I obeyed him. I undressed and lay down on the bed. He lay down on top of me. Father Thomas did something that I know today is called conilingus. I had already satisfied Father Marie Dominique orally before. At the time, he wasn't verbal. Instead, he used gestures and signs to get me to do it. I did the same with Father Thomas. It wasn't very pleasant, because he was already an older man and didn't really take care of himself. He didn't smell very good. But I took it as a form of penitence. I could have refused in principle, but I felt like a bird that had been hypnotized by a snake. I could have flown away, but I was paralyzed. Michelle France was unable to find the strength to escape from the two brothers who took turns abusing her when they visited. As a good nun, she didn't dare to defy the authority of either priest. She was, like many nuns, penniless. A year later, Father Thomas asked her to begin working at a Catholic community called L'Arche, the Ark, where he was a spiritual advisor. Michelle France became a staff member and moved into the house where she still lives today. Marsh was founded in 1964 in Trolley in northern France. The group is active internationally and has 152 communes on all continents. The Christian Organization for the Intellectually Disabled is run by nuns and volunteers. Father Thomas then victimized nuns and volunteers in the community's main house, while continuing to abuse Michel France. He would summon me regularly in the evening. I had to wait in the chapel where he would pick me up. Then he repeated what had already happened back at the convent. It had almost become routine. I don't quite remember exactly, but I'd say it happened about every two weeks. Not every day, because as I soon found out, I wasn't the only one that Father Thomas was taking to bed.
He told me that his spiritual guidance was a bit different. And eventually, we were taking off our clothes. And his hands were everywhere. I don't know all the precise terms for it, but we did increasingly intimate things. I never thought there were any other victims. I never would have thought that Father Thomas had been a serial sexual predator for a while. The cleric used his position as spiritual advisor at large to sexually abuse the women of the community for nearly three decades. The only thing that stopped the abuse was his death in 1993. But his victims didn't dare speak openly about what he had done to them until 14 years later. Jean de la Selle, the former administrative director of the French Larche community, took the first statement from Michel France in 2007. Michelle France told me I was abused by Father Thomas. I asked her to write down what happened to her in a statement. She asked to remain anonymous, which I could easily understand because she was an employee. He was understanding and he said I could rely on his discretion. And for years he absolutely kept his word. Thirty-five years after the first incident, Michelle France still cannot imagine exposing the two priests who abused her. Abused nuns are often troubled by a mix of shame about having broken their vows of chastity and fears of perjury. Anyone who accuses a priest insults the church and violates the commandment of obedience, to which a nun is bound. An Italian nun is working to help free the sisters from their troubled silence. She offers support at this Dionysian centre in Milan to nuns who are doubting their vocation. Her work allowed her to collect countless cases of women who'd been abused within the church. This is an excerpt from a letter I received. The woman writes, Forgive me that I am writing you about this, but I am too ashamed to speak about it, and I actually really fear that I will be declared evil or crazy. Just tell me if you don't believe me. I would nevertheless be thankful because you've given me time, but I would really prefer to leave. A faithful woman, a nun who has dedicated herself to God and who is abused within the church is wounded in a way that affects her entire personality and inevitably calls her beliefs into question. During the journey that I make with these women, such violent pain sometimes comes to the surface that they become loud in a lament against God. The church leaves its handmaidens alone with their curse. They receive only indifference from an institution to which they have sworn loyalty. In Kokanya, a remote Canadian village, a psychotherapist and nun treats the trauma. She's working with a victim from Montreal 
a former nun who was regularly abused by a priest. No one listened to me when I tried to talk about it and tell the truth. Nobody wanted to meet me or listen. As a grown woman, you often hear, you're an adult, forget it, start a new chapter. That just adds insult to injury. Lucie decided to travel a thousand kilometers to see Sister Marie Paul after six years of depression. She's just started her third year of therapy. I felt very guilty about doing what he told me to, to get undressed when he told me I should get undressed. You were put under a lot of stress. Isn't that what you felt? Yes, complete physical and psychological stress. Say it again. It was as if I didn't exist, as if I was there simply for sexual gratification. For the priest? Yes. Yes. Then I just buried it deep. I had to work, earn money. I'm going to start crying. <laughs> you have every reason to. I was all on my own. You were all alone with it. That's right. That's right. You don't have to apologize for it. You were alone. A whole mudslide rolled over you, and you fought your way out with just the clothes on your back. That's horrible. Marie-Paul Ross has a PhD in sexology and has tirelessly maintained for 20 years that many men of the cloth cannot control their sexual urges. She was a practicing psychotherapist and nun in Quebec until 2005. But her superiors suggested she move her practice to New Brunswick, where she would be less visible. A report made the rounds in the religious community that said I was dangerous. Nuns and priests sent me letters condemning me and wrote that I came from the devil's school. The truth isn't there to cause a scandal. A scandal doesn't help anything. But the truth can be liberating. And if we don't tell the truth, how can we set the world free? Marie-Paul Ross doesn't just relieve the nuns of their burden of guilt. She also encourages them to face and fight the priests and what they did with a special kind of hybrid therapy she's developed. Here, write all the names of the people who have hurt you very badly and were very unfair to you. You can speak. Lucie, you have the right to do so. That is death. Continue. Continue. Say what they are. They are murderers. They are murderers. Keep talking. He is perverted. A pervert. Tell him. If I may say so. Tell him. Stay with me. Look at me. Take this into your hands. I'm afraid of it. Destroy him. Go ahead. I'll chop him into little bits. He had it coming. Tape it up. Do you want to stay a victim? Kill him. Come on. I'll stick the knife in. That's the dagger. I'll kill him. Damn, yes, go on. Keep it up. Just stay in your own shit. You're crazy. You're sick. Okay. 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 That feels good. Of course. And who wins? I feel better, much stronger. Back in Trollibroy in France, 
Michel France and the other victims of Father Thomas finally decided to file a formal complaint against their former spiritual advisor, 11 years after his death. Jean de Lasselle received another witness statement in 2014 from a second woman from the Lash community. It was clear what Michel France had recounted wasn't an isolated case. We got another statement. Jean de Lasselle asked me, don't you think it's about time that you talk too? And I said yes. I found it hard to say I accuse Father Thomas. When you accuse a priest, it also reflects on the church. And if you love the church, it's hard to take that step and report a priest's misdeeds. The church uses its grace to grant forgiveness to the faithful who confess their sins. But the church only ever admits its own mistakes if the pressure becomes too great. Statements from members of the large community began to pile up. Church law experts no longer had a choice. They had to address the allegations. Father Markovitz investigated the incidents and at the end of December 2014 submitted a well-documented confidential report about Father Thomas' transgressions. I met Father Markovitz on December 13, 2014. I know that he asked me and others, somewhat embarrassedly, but I think he felt that he had to ask me the question about what the two fathers did so that their victims didn't become pregnant. I told him that the act ended in my mouth and that this was likely the case with the others as well. He was the first churchman with whom I spoke, and he apparently believed me. Father Thomas interacted sexually with adult women, during which, as he said, he was searching for and trying to impart a mystical experience. These abuses and their justification show a warped perspective. There are known and likely unknown victims who deserve justice. I think it's very important that the truth has now come out, that Father Thomas is seen for what he was, a manipulative pervert. And that they stop putting Father Thomas and the Larche community on a pedestal and that they simply just admit to the truth. of the Holy See say that women are not a source of truth. The truth is God's message, and it is spread by men who are above all reproach. Doris was made to feel the consequences of this teaching. The priest forced Doris into sexual contact several times in Rome. She wasn't able to talk about it until 2010. The priest was reassigned to other tasks, and an internal investigation initiated later by the church did not lead to any measures under church law. Doris left Rome in 2010. She decided to leave the community a year later. The community required her to free it from all claims in exchange for a sum of money to get her back on her feet. But I had to move, I had to establish a life, and I had worked for eight years for this community with no pay. Doris filed a complaint against the priest in 2012. The investigation was later suspended, saying there wasn't sufficient evidence of criminal behaviour. And in one case, the criminal justice system had no jurisdiction. The church has many ways to keep nuns quiet. It sometimes appeals to God to buy their silence. I'm going so that the people will see the faces of the women who suffered under Father Thomas, so that it becomes real and tangible. 
Cecilia and Michelle France were invited to an unusual mass on an April morning in 2017, a service for the victims of Father Thomas. After fighting for 10 years for recognition of their suffering, a mass of forgiveness was being held in their name. Those responsible in the community were hoping that this extremely rare ceremony would encourage the women to drop their allegations. I'll stand up in front of the community and say, I'm one of you. They'll see that I'm a human of flesh and blood who cries and smiles. The investigation has found 10 victims, but we know there were far more. Today isn't the big day for me, but it's a great day. It's not an opportunity for me to make peace with having been abused, because that's not possible. But it starts a new chapter. Three guest bishops attended the Mass in Trollibroy, including the prelate responsible for the L'Arche community. They discreetly celebrated Mass in the community chapel to ask for forgiveness. Only the victims, close friends and family were invited. We pretended to be friends of Cecilia and Michelle France. We also met the former secretary of the community. A solemn occasion, isn't it? Yes, that's why I'm dressed like this. I would never usually wear this. These images were only intended for the victims of the large community. The three prelates opened the mass with a hymn. The victims were allowed to speak first. Michelle France started out. My name is Michel France Penu. All of us here today have suffered. We were all deceived and abused, spiritually abused at first, but some of us were also sexually abused by someone we trusted, whom we were introduced to and who introduced himself to us as a man of God. I think of all the victims who are unknown, who dare not speak, and who will remain wounded for their entire life. I'm doing that for you, you who've decided to dedicate your lives to the community of Lash, and who are shocked by the revelations of Father Thomas' sordid past. The bishop who oversees the L'Arche community asked for forgiveness on behalf of the church. The first time a priest asked for forgiveness from abused women. Je pense particulièrement aux femmes qui ont confié. I think particularly of the women who have confessed or who remain silent about the fact that they were sexually abused by Father Thomas. In the face of this suffering, we want to listen and understand better. I, as bishop, and the brother bishops, Jacques and Gerard, and many other bishops. I, as the bishop who guides Lash International, and who, through his ordination, is connected with all other priests of the Catholic Church, am asking for forgiveness today. As you know, the Church is terribly ashamed of these acts. The Church representative's remorse was supposed to remain behind the walls of the small chapel. That feels good. 
My only fear is that this mass will never become public knowledge. It was filmed, but they said it's only for the victims who couldn't attend. It won't be made public. <laughs> the highest Catholic authorities were hoping this act of penitence would put Father Thomas' misdeeds behind them. Because the Vatican had long been aware of his actions, Father Thomas was first convicted of sexually abusing women in other communities 65 years before this act of contrition. In 1952, Father Thomas was summoned to Rome in 1952. He was tried and forbidden to perform mass, give sacraments, teach others, and above all, forbidden from providing spiritual guidance. These internal sanctions, which are considered severe punishment in canon law, had no effect. The priest re-offended for decades as superiors looked on. I think that's a scandal. How do you explain that? Sister Véronique Macron is the chairwoman of the French Conference of Superior Nuns and Brothers. She's a specialist in the theology of morality and ethics and has trouble accepting the church's lax position in this case. I cannot comprehend how somebody who has committed such a crime could again be entrusted with an office. It's virtually impossible to ensure that something like this will never happen again. That's why they have to take precautions at the very least. The institution must do all it can to protect potential victims. That's the least it's obliged to do, and if that doesn't happen for me, that's a disaster. By closing its eyes, the church gave Father Thomas carte blanche to do as he pleased. He was able to draw an army of priests into his web of twisted vice, emulators who until recently were committing crimes just like he did. Father Thomas certainly had pupils who he initiated into this madness. We met one of them a priest who had abused an assistant. The assistant told her parents. The parents, who knew the priest, asked him, is what our daughter is saying true? The priest answered, I can understand you are upset, but I want to point out that Father Thomas assigned me with the task of providing guidance for your daughter. This email is from 2013. Father Thomas had been dead for 20 years by then. If I have failed to understand and carry out this spiritual guidance correctly, I ask for forgiveness. But if a mistake has been made here, we must blame Father Thomas because he saw all of this and guided it. That's insane. The priest trained by Father Thomas abused the young woman for seven years. Bishop Jacques Benoit Gonard was supposed to supervise him. The bishop banned him from preaching in 2016, but did not expel him from the church or the community. Father Gilbert may no longer hear confessions or provide guidance for others. I am not demanding that anyone lose the respect for Father Gilbert that corresponds to the relationship that he had with them and with the office he occupied for many years. Did the bishop condemn him? He condemned the deeds, but not his person. That's because of the brotherly bond that exists between members of the clergy. This brotherliness gives them continued support, regardless of the circumstances. That makes them privileged in that they are immune from prosecution. Priests are subject to a different law than minor mortals. Their immunity from prosecution goes back to divine law. 
and some of them instrumentalize the word of God as they perform their heavenly mission. They issue new commandments that allow them to do what they will with nuns. Father Marie Dominique was one Catholic church guru who developed divergent doctrines. In 1975, the first tormentor of Michel France founded La Famille Saint-Jean, or the Community of Saint-Jean, a group of more than 800 clergy with residencies in 24 countries and on four continents. A vocation has many facets and can be difficult to explain. When it comes to faith, it's a special and personal call from Jesus, the one who came to save humanity. Starting in 1975, the leader of the Little Greys, called that because of their grey habits, initiated his devotees in the teaching of Amour Amicitié, or the love of friendship, but distorted it to link spirituality and sexuality. To stimulate vocations, he established schools for young people between 18 and 30 years old who wanted to deepen their faith. Catherine wanted to join a holy order in 2003. She joined the Maison Saint Jean, one of the community's French schools near Tours. The 18 year old then fell into the clutches of her confessor a priest who was acting in accordance with the teaching of his spiritual leaders. He first touched me one evening after everyone had left. I was sick. He closed the office windows and said, you don't need prayers, you need these gestures, they will bring you closer to God. Then these gestures became more intense and from then on it was hell. After a few months, he touched my breast, took off my bra or let his hand wander down below. One time he took off my panties and I didn't really understand what was happening. The priest touched me before granting absolution. And you have to know that a priest hearing confession and granting absolution is at that point acting as Christ in person, so as a figure of God. I always thought that when he touched me, he was acting in God's name, so I couldn't question it because it was the will of God, and it took place in the chapel, so there was no reason to question it. Christian Terras is a whistleblower. The editor-in-chief of Golius magazine is an expert on the rhetoric of the community's priests, who interpret the Gospel of St. John to allow them to satisfy their sexual desires. They use reading the Gospel of St. John to subjugate women not just spiritually, but also to suit their sexual perversion. They are strategies for rape. They are crimes of rape. If you instrumentalize religious texts like the Gospel to abuse a person, especially one whom you're assigned to advise spiritually, then what we have is, if the deed is committed, rape. In the church, there's only one Lord, and that's Christ. Anyone who presents themselves as the Lord, or even the absolute Lord, is a fraud. He's a fraud, as it says in the Gospel, a servant is not greater than his Lord above Christ. The entire being of Christ is in service of raising, liberating the other. The devout should open his heart and live life. It's the absolute opposite of taking possession.
Catherine left the school in 2004. The young woman has since tried to kill herself 30 times. She turned to the law in 2011. Her complaint was denied with the justification the statute of limitations had expired. After that, she wrote Pope Francis twice. The Vatican never contacted me directly, neither verbally nor in writing. What came was just a letter to my parents. They admitted to the abuse in the letter and declared their solidarity with me. The Vatican was also aware of the repeated assaults made by her priest. This is clear from a letter from December 2014 from the general prior of the community of St. John to the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith, the judicial authority of the Holy See. Reverend, it seems to me that Brother M has acknowledged his deed and is penitent, but I will continue to keep an eye on him. Since Brother M is otherwise a good superior within the community, I have allowed him to keep his position. A year later, in 2015, the Vatican's judicial apparatus suspended the good superior from his duties for 12 months. Then it hastily transferred him to Rome. A priest in Vercors in the French Alps knows exactly the kind of martyrdom Catherine suffered and the methods his institution uses to protect serial sex offenders. Hi, Catherine. How are you? A little better. I've managed to reconcile myself somewhat with the church. Father Vignor takes care of women who the church has victimized. As the black sheep of the Diocese of Valence, he's campaigned against immunity from prosecution for his brothers in faith who have strayed. That is my duty as a priest. My mission is to face these difficult and painful cases and to meet with and listen to the victims. Members of the church who have committed crimes must be charged and punished. The rural priest had a seat on the canonical tribunal of Lyon, the second largest diocese in France, until 2018. Le Seigneur soit avec vous. He lost his position because of his openness in helping the victims. Selon Saint Jean, gloire à toi. The former judge confirms that the decisions made by the tribunal were censored by the Vatican. The judges who hear the cases of clerics who've committed sex crimes pronounce judgment, but in the end, everything is handled by Rome. We would have far fewer problems if the principles of the Church as they are expressed in the Second Vatican Council and the Code of Canon Law were used. Because things would be far clearer. I think the Church shields itself and protects these sex offenders too much. They must be stripped of their clerical status to ensure clearly that they are no longer priests. Poverty, chastity and obedience. Throughout the 40-year existence of the community of St. John, none of the brothers who followed Father Marie Dominique's teaching of Amor Amicitiae was ever removed from office. Only a few pedophile priests were convicted after they were exposed by Christian Terras. But the grace of the Holy See was always extended to the community's founder and its other sex offenders. Les frères de Saint Jean sont nés quelque part. The brothers of Saint John came from the generation of John Paul II. This pope began a new evangelicalism. The brothers of Saint John were among the soldiers of this evangelicalism and were made untouchable. 
It was unimaginable to John Paul II to even hear the slightest criticism or condemnation of a founder such as Father Marie Dominique. It was simply impossible. Father Marie Dominique died in 2006, one year after the death of John Paul II. At the funeral of the founder of the community of St. John, the new pontiff, Benedict XVI, and the Bishop of Lyon, Cardinal Barbarin, honored the memory of a holy man. It was, as some of you have said, an intense family reunion upon the death of the founding father. An enormous screen was hung up in the square in front of the cathedral in Lyon. St. John's Cathedral was full. What was also very unusual, all sorts of politicians were there. In his sermon, Cardinal Barbarin effusively praised the services of Father Marie Dominique. Mercredi matin. On Wednesday morning in Rome, I had a conversation with the Holy Father. His words we hear first. The Holy Father asks the Lord to accept the man into his kingdom. He spent long years initiating many people to the teachings of Christ, made a testimony that he conveyed, give the needed inspiration to those he instructed to ensure the gospel of Christ continues to be proclaimed, received and lived. The Vatican's message was just as outrageous as Barbarin's sermon. After the death of its spiritual leader, a few of the victims of the community of St. John finally dared to speak out. But it took another decade for Roman Catholic judicial authorities, and then only internally, to concede to the many cases of abuse in the community. In a confidential document from June 2016, the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith described the crimes of Marie Dominique and his followers. Several witness statements were submitted to church authorities. They revealed unchastity in his emotional and sexual life with serious offenses persistently involving young women who were subordinate to him. This misconduct also manifested itself in the deplorable, scandalous behavior of many of the brothers of faith, in some cases in paedophilia, but also in the sexual abuse of the mainly young women for whom they were responsible. He who confesses a sin will be forgiven. For Catholic judicial authorities, the case was closed. None of the St. John's sex offenders were charged by secular prosecutors, and none of the victims received legal recognition or saw their assailants convicted. The victims will stay victims and die as victims, as long as the church grants forgiveness and compassion without legal action. As long as priests are allowed to behave like lords over the nuns in their community, the women will remain their prey. In areas where missions are common, Asia, Latin America and Africa, nuns are sometimes even reduced to sex slavery. In 2017, a nun left a community in which her fellow sisters were sexually exploited. And the former missionary has received death threats from her order since. They fear she'll tell all. For her own safety, we interviewed her in Benin, rather than her West African homeland. During my 21 years in an order, I met many sisters who were abused sexually and morally in various ways. 
I decided to leave because that was fundamentally against my ideas of how I wanted to serve the Lord. The abuse was organized and planned in her order, starting with the training, known as formation. Constance discovered early on that she would be expected to sleep with her spiritual advisor. A European priest would guide her as she prepared to take her vows. He said, you want to take your vows? I can help you, just as I did all the others. I'll take care of your family, but you have to be ready for what he called the economy of salvation. I asked what that was, and he said, I do that with the others too. He named other sisters and said, the economy of salvation meant that a priest and sister had sex with each other. I told him I wasn't prepared to do that, so he refused to help me but I discovered that he helped many other sisters. The ones whose families he helped had slept with him. During the time they were still novices and in formation, he slept with them. The thing that hit me hardest was that those same sisters were the ones who later were named superior nuns for certain countries or provinces. This twisting of the term economy of salvation was just the first move towards exploiting the women who were stepping up to serve God. As nuns, these sisters were marketed by superior nuns who were supposed to instruct and guide them. The superior nuns made deals with the priests. The priests gave the superior nuns money, they then provided the priests with nuns. The nun is told the money is destined for the work of their order, but the nun soon realizes that's prostitution, that's how it works. The superior nuns and priests leverage human misery. When a sister is needy and presents her problem to the priest, he assures her he will help. And at the beginning, he actually does help. But at some point, he asks her to come to him and sleep with him. The nuns don't want to do that, but they don't have a choice. A woman who is not dependent on a man can say no. Father Ludovic Lado is a critical spirit within the Catholic Church in Cameroon. The Jesuit repeatedly condemns the machinations of African clerics, saying they are like mafiosos. Poverty is the main problem that makes some of these nuns vulnerable to acts of accommodation. They become victims to a wide variety of sexual and physical abuse. The nuns must often give their savings to the order or community. But they're still vulnerable to sexual exploitation even when they're sent to Rome. An event held behind closed doors at the Vatican sets us on the trail of this type of clerical pandering in the immediate vicinity of the Holy See. A seminar was held on May 31st, 2015 at the Vatican about women in the church. A Congolese nun and professor at the Pontifical Urbaniana University took the opportunity to denounce the routine prostitution of some of her fellow student sisters in Rome. Dario Menor, a correspondent for a Spanish Catholic journal, covered the event. He witnessed Rita's spectacular revelations as an external observer. It wasn't a spontaneous speech. They took turns giving presentations. 
Everyone had a chance and she gave her speech. You have to underline that she used the situation intentionally. There were people at the event who cared about the position of women in the church, who were thinking about it and researching it. In front of all these people from the church, she raised her voice and made the actions public. Without a doubt, it was courageous of her to speak about this issue in front of this audience. Sister Rita's warning wasn't supposed to go beyond internal church debate. But after the seminar, when the nun came out onto the street, Dario Menor spoke to her and recorded her feelings. The congregation is not too poor. The orders are too poor or they're indifferent to the nuns. They send them to school, but the nuns don't have the means. They're forced to beg. They trust these benefactors, who then exploit them. They pay with their bodies because they don't have anything else. You have to sell whatever product you have. You can use what God has given you to make the deals necessary for survival, and nobody cares. They are problems that everyone knows about, but nobody wants to discuss. And if you talk to the Vatican about it... I want an answer. This is the first time. The first time? Yes, I want a concrete answer. To take care of it or to help the victims, because they're the children of God too. Sister Rita said her superiors told her to be silent after she gave her speech. But before she fell silent again, she sent us a final message through her Spanish interviewer, an appeal to help her exploited sisters when they are expelled from their orders because of pregnancy. If they get pregnant, they must leave the convent. There's no help from the order or the church. They're sent away. They're poor. No one cares. That's scandalous. They're treated like lepers in the Old Testament. None of their fellow sisters speak with them. Charity is at the heart of the church's mission, but it's not applied to the nuns who've been sexually abused and become pregnant. The institution that has failed to protect them treats them as if they're godless. After a few weeks of pregnancy, a Congolese nun who had been raped by her parish priest had to leave Rome in 2011. Her order, the Petit Sor de Nazareth, sent the 40-year-old woman into exile in Pesaro on the Adriatic coast. Without money or a place to live, Grace found shelter in this residential dormitory. The head of the dormitory offered the distraught nun the help of a local lawyer, free of charge. Grace era in una situazione molto particolare. La prima cosa che Grace was in a unique situation. The first thing I learned from her was that she was a nun who had become pregnant after being raped when she was studying at the Pontifical University. She met a monk there from home who then sexually abused her. The series of events left her in a grave psychological state. Towards the end of her pregnancy, Grace was paralyzed with fear. The woman who ran the residence didn't know what to do, so she wrote to the superior of the order. At that point, the answer came immediately. It was almost an edict or an order. Grace was to give the child to God. 
That was another way, a euphemism, to say that the child should be given up for adoption and Grace should return to the order. Normally, an order must take care of its sisters, and naturally for the child that has been born. Father Hans Solner is a close confidant of Pope Francis. He has been active in the fight against sexual abuse in the church. These are, of course, horrible situations. It's very difficult. The church must ensure that the sisters can live in peace with their families and children. The church should take care of nuns who have been raped as well as their children, but it doesn't. A day after delivering the child in this hospital, Grace obeyed her superiors. At the time of the birth, Grace was given the usual forms of recognition and identity of the child. Because Grace was then still subject to her vow of obedience, she complied with the command she received. And she repeated this command, word for word, to the midwife. She said, I offer this child to God. After a short time, I don't know anymore how long it was after the birth, the order gave another instruction through the landlady. Let's call it that. And another message. It said that Grace should no longer consider herself a member of the order. We, members of the order, thank you for all that you have done for our sister. We regrettably confirm that you can no longer be a member of our order. We ask you to help her and accommodate her according to your means and her needs. God bless you, the Superior General of the Order. Grace lost everything in March 2012. Her baby Elisa and her life as a nun, for which she had agreed to give up her child. The former sister felt the church had cheated her out of everything. Her lawyer then opened an unusual lawsuit. He wanted to get Elisa back from her adoptive family and turn her over to her mother. After two long years in court, Grace got her daughter back. The child was unaware of her mother's horrible secret. But Grace's case is an exception. Many former nuns are forced to commit what the church has taught them is one of the gravest sins of all. Constance's West African homeland, nuns who've become pregnant by priests have little hope of keeping their children. When a nun becomes pregnant and wants to keep the child, she must leave the order and receives no money. Here in Africa, an unwanted pregnancy is already scandalous, even if the woman isn't a nun. But a pregnant nun is viewed as a devil and is even banished from her own family. Many despair. I know a woman who was cast out by everyone. She wanted an abortion and died during it. She went to some quack abortionist and she died. To avoid scandals, priests and superior nuns prefer to handle the pregnancies quietly. 
Most of the 50 nuns studying at Constance's Catholic University had had abortions with the help of a doctor from the local hospital. The doctor was courting me. I asked, don't you see that I'm a nun? And he said, come into my office, I'll show you something. And he got out a list. Those are all the nuns who've had abortions. And you want to tell me you're holy? Are you the Virgin Mary in person? I was ashamed. I don't know how many have been raped and not become pregnant, but 32 of the 50 nuns in our order had abortions after being sexually abused by a priest. The Catholic Church condemns abortions. It rejects them because of the culture of life. That a congregation would demand a nun get an abortion is, in my eyes, an abomination. It's completely contrary to what the congregation and the church represent. I don't know what kind of thinking is behind something like that. Priests on all continents have long pressured their victims to terminate the lives their crimes have spawned. Marie Paul Ross was a missionary before she became a psychotherapist. She began as a nurse for the Sisters of the Immaculate Conception in the 1970s in South America. As a nurse, I became acquainted with the secret sex lives of priests and nuns. When I was in Peru, I heard of women who had sexual relationships with priests and of others who, after having a relationship with a priest, had an abortion because the priest forced them to. That is unacceptable. These people take vows. They commit themselves to doing something that is incomprehensible to them. The psychotherapist nun has been working with the repressed sexuality that drives men of the church to extremes for four decades. Sometimes the rebellious nun also deals with the consciences of remorseful sex offenders. Today, she's going to Quebec for therapy with Roland. Roland is a special case. As a priest, he often exhibited deviant sexual behavior. And as an adult priest, he had a wild sex life. He's one of the few who have sought help. He wants to confront the problem, speak openly, and clearly say that he's sorry for what he's done. She was subject to your power. How was it for the woman? She certainly hadn't consented. Okay. She said she didn't want to. That wasn't why she was there. Okay. I heard that. You heard that? Yes. And you kept on going? Yes, exactly. And if a nun got pregnant by a priest? <laughs> Anything is possible, even that the priest would demand that she abort the child. That's a reality in the church? Yes. That priests get nuns pregnant? Yes. And then tell them to terminate? Yes, that's right. That really happens? Yes. Are you afraid you got a woman pregnant? I was always careful that they didn't get pregnant. I behaved accordingly. There was no penetration. That wasn't possible. You thought about it? Yes.
God is the sole creator of life. From the First Vatican Council in 1312 until the encyclical of Pope John Paul II in 1995, the Church has always seen abortion as a mortal sin. It is considered murder and is punished with excommunication. So how does the Church view abortions that are performed even after they would legally be allowed? Rose, a nun who is close to Constance, was forced to abort in her eighth month. The superior always held her up as an example. That's why it was a problem when she was pregnant. The superior told her, don't worry, we'll get rid of the child. The priest also didn't want to keep the child because he feared problems. By then, she was already in the 32nd week. The child was alive. First, its heart was stopped so that she could bring it into the world. It was a boy. When she saw him, it caused her great pain. She even showed me a photo of the baby. She said that even as the baby was stillborn, she had already been promoted by the superior. They named her provincial superior immediately. But she lost all the joy in her life. She wasn't herself. Before, she'd been a cheerful woman, but this experience left its mark. Not only is it illegal in most of the world's countries, in the 32nd week it's illegal everywhere, but it's also a severe trauma, a spiritual trauma. Caroline de Mazur teaches theology in Rome and is the doctoral advisor of Mary Lembo. The Tongolese nun is finishing her doctoral thesis at the Pontifical University Gregoriana. She's writing about priests sexually abusing nuns in West African countries. These nuns have a very difficult life of suffering. They say that they've been destroyed, fully devastated. They have horrible feelings of guilt. First, because of the trespass of the abuse, but also due to the knowledge that life has been destroyed within them. They carry an extinguished life within. Sister Mary Lembo's thesis was nearly finished, but would it be published? The Holy See tolerates internal protests, but it's incapable of recognizing guilt for deeds that it condemns itself as a mortal sin. A few weeks later, the Pope held a general audience in which he harshly condemned lay people who had abortions. He felt they were inexcusable. La catechesi di oggi è dedicata alla quinta parola. Today's catechism is dedicated to the fifth commandment, thou shalt not kill. You could say that all evil in the world goes back to this disregard for life. A contrary approach permits the destruction of human life in the womb. It's not right. A human being, no matter how small it is, cannot be swept aside in order to solve a problem. That's like trying to find a contract killer to solve a problem. Could it be possible that Pope Francis didn't know that the church itself had already used contract killers? Whistleblowers as far back as two decades ago presented the Vatican with clear evidence the church had precisely this problem within its own ranks.
It's a horrible story that's been knowingly silenced by the great and the good in the Vatican. But a man in the US state of Missouri knows the truth. Tom Roberts was the editor-in-chief of a progressive Catholic journal that had good sources about the Vatican. At the end of the 1990s, a source passed on two explosive reports that came from two nuns. We received those reports um, probably 1998 uh, or 99. And because the material was so disturbing and so shocking, we wanted to be absolutely sure uh, that the contents were legitimate. And, um, and so in order to, to verify them, uh, it took some time. And it was about um, almost two years. And that story that priests were, were abusing women religious because they thought them safe targets where HIV AIDS was rampant, uh, just began to take hold and it was not denied anywhere. Um, and we, we, we approached even officials of, of men's organ, uh, um, orders and, and people in the Vatican who, who said to us, one of them particularly, that this was not a one-off situation, that these weren't unusual, that he believed this was a problem that really had to be addressed. The first report, finished in 1994, came from an American nun, Sister Maura O'Donoghue. She was a doctor and the coordinator of the AIDS program of Caritas International, a social and medical aid organization of the church. She worked all over the globe for several years. During her travels, she discovered that nuns were regularly sexually abused. This information comes from missionaries, priests, and other people close to the church. It is not isolated to one country or continent. The following examples are the results of six years of experience in 23 countries on all five continents. The sisters accused priests, saying they were sexually abused because the priests feared catching AIDS if they had sexual contact with prostitutes or, quote, risky women. Le sida étant là, pourquoi les religieuses? Why were nuns sexually abused in AIDS regions? Because nuns certainly wouldn't have AIDS. The priests satisfied their urges with nuns, who, unlike prostitutes or women from the community, pose no threat. Four years later, in 1998, a nun alerted the General Superior of the Missionary Sisters of Our Lady of Africa. She then told the Vatican. In her report, which was entitled The Problem of Sexual Abuse of African Nuns in Africa and Rome, Sister Marie MacDonald denounced her nuns being forced to have abortions. Despite many attempts to improve the situation, things only seem to be getting worse. If a nun becomes pregnant, she is often forced to have an abortion by the priest responsible. As a rule, the nun is expelled from her order, while the priest is just moved to another congregation or sent to study in a different place. The impenetrable wall of silence on the issue is only exacerbating it. But the wall of silence remains. The secret reports from both nuns were ignored until an anonymous source leaked them to the media. Tom Roberts published them in the National Catholic Reporter in March 2011. I don't think that it took it seriously at first or at least attempted to just sort of brush it off. Um, if you're sitting in the Vatican and you're being told that missionaries and people who are who are doing the, the, the heaviest lifting in the community 
are being abused by the community's pastors and keepers. Uh, you'd think there would be outrage that, you know, that would really roil the community, and there really wasn't very much. Why was that never made public? What happened to the reports from Sister O'Donohue and Sister McDonald? There simply wasn't any media or public information on the issue. Today the public knows about child abuse and pedophilia, but not this issue of the sexual abuse of nuns by priests. That still has to be established. In the spring of 2001, the revelations of sisters Moira and Marie were only accessible to a small circle of Catholic readers. But a few members of the European Parliament took up the topic, those on the Committee on Women's Rights and Equality, including Patsy Zurensen. In the Committee uh, Women Equality, um, we start talking about it. And then, yeah, then we have to, there, we need, there was a need to do something. We, we can't let it there. There was a need to react. And the quickest way was to make a proposal for a resolution so that it go to the commission. And then that we can start in it and we can bring it out. Next, I'd like to ask Ms. Sorensen to take a minute. Nuns have been intimidated in several countries because they became pregnant by priests and had to leave their order. For the resolution to pass, the committee had to convince many parliamentary representatives. They met with resistance organized by men from the Vatican. In this case, uh, was the influence from the Vatican uh, uh, very strong, uh, not to go further. Uh, but also their influence in all the committees and all the uh, people from the European Commission and the Council was very strong. There was uh, a lot of lobbyists in the Parliament because I met them from time to time. And then they say, oh, it's only in Africa. This was not true. It was in Europe. It was in a lot of in the ACP countries. One man intentionally spread disinformation just as the investigation was getting started. Joaquin Navarro Valls, the spokesman for the Holy See and a close confidant of John Paul II. The reaction from the Vatican was very disappointed because he, uh, he don't say it don't exist. He say, yes, it's possible in some areas uh, outside, far away, and you have to think on the circumstances there. Poor priests, sorry for their behavior, but it's normal there. Huh? Sorry. Then uh, in another job, you have to kick you out. Huh? And, uh, and you go in prison because you accept crimes. This is a shame. It's a sh this whole thing is a shame of the church. A shame for the Vatican. And you have to recognize that. The Holy See's lobbying efforts failed. The EU Parliament passed a resolution on April 5, 2001, calling upon the Vatican to finally take action. The European Parliament calls on the Holy See to take all allegations of sexual abuse within its organizations seriously to cooperate with the authorities and to remove the perpetrators from office, calls for those responsible for these crimes to be arrested and brought to justice, calls on the prosecutors in the 23 countries cited in the reports to ensure that all appropriate judicial action is taken to establish the truth. The demands from the EU Parliament addressed to Vatican City went unanswered. But the amount of evidence and witness statements forced those close to the Pope to acknowledge the problem in 2018 and admit it was still happening. In questi rapporti viene detto che in questo tipo di abuso In the reports it said that this sexual abuse was related to something that went beyond local and regional events. 
Bene, in parte sono d'accordo perché I agree with some of that. trascende almeno diciamo because it certainly goes beyond natural boundaries and across continents o anche dei continenti. La struttura della chiesa come qualcosa che The church is a closed structure that gives power to the men. The priests che ai sacerdoti e assolutamente oltre that goes beyond what's permitted permessa e io penso and i think i can say with a certain amount of conviction that the pope is aware of it sia a conoscenza il papa will pope francis restrict the unlimited power that priests have over the women and will he return to God's daughters the dignity to which they are entitled? We asked the Holy Father in April 2018 to meet with Doris and Michelle France to show official recognition of the suffering of abused nuns and to emphasize his desire for reform. We turn to Cardinal Giovanni Angelo Bertschu, who at the time was the substitute for general affairs within the Vatican Secretariat of State and who was responsible for France. We presented him with all the results of our research, the lists and the statements of our witnesses to ensure the request was taken seriously. Three months and many follow-up calls later, we received the following answer from the number two within the Secretariat. Madame, thank you for the information regarding your documentary film about a situation that, for me, as well as the entire church, involves a great deal of regret. I assure you that we are taking your proposal for the Holy Father to meet with the two nuns seriously. I will inform you immediately of any decision that is taken. Persistent follow-ups finally led to a proposal from the Vatican in December 2018. The Pope would meet Michel France and Doris, but only in the smallest of groups and without cameras or outside observers. We spoke with our witnesses and decided not to allow the victims to once again be forced to limit their voices in a private meeting. We would only once again allow the Holy Father to continue his silence about the sexual abuse of nuns in the Catholic Church. Oh. 